So in case you missed uh, the recording of Tuesday because I recorded the wrong screen, um, I did another recording for my uh, Monday Wednesday class, so you can watch that one instead. Okay, so that one has the same content. The uh, CISP 310 recording from yesterday, the Wednesday, has the same content as the one on Tuesday because I wasn't you know, paying attention and was not right, uh, recording the correct screen on that day. All right, so we are now transitioning into um, TTP. So this is the actual programming part of this class where we are starting to write program or code to run in this particular processor. It's called TTP because it is tax toy processor. That's basically what it is. It's a tiny little toy processor where you can actually see everything running, okay? All right, so let me explain one more thing, you know, and then we'll go ahead and actually get started with today's topic. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen the VA engine uh, models when you were a kid, or you have seen other people have it. Something like this, okay? So let me show you what it looks like. Okay. So the question is, are you going to put one of these things in your Mustang and expect it to go from 0 to 60 in less than 10 minutes? No, it's not going to work, okay? That is not the purpose of a model like this. What is the model, what is the purpose of a model like this? Why would anyone spend $60 to buy an engine that doesn't work, that you cannot put into a car at all? Hmm? To, simulate. to simulate, to understand how an engine works, okay? So depending on which version you get, like this one has, is transparent, you can actually the, see the piston, and this is not even a V8, you know, this one has four cylinders in it, so it's only an inline four engine, but it still has the timing belt, okay? It has the pistons, and I'm not sure whether the valves are actually operational or not. But it is a model to teach you about internal combustion, particularly a four-cycle internal combustion engine. It, talk, it will teach you about the intake cycle, the compression cycle, the, you know, the power cycle, and also the exhaust cycle. And it will also teach you how the four cylinders, each one will do a different cycle at the same time, and how the piston will move, and also how the crankshaft is going to be turned by the piston via vertical movement. So the crankshaft will turn that vertical movement into the you know, rotational movement. So it is an illustration device, okay? Same thing here. So if you go back to this thing here, it is not going to be fabricated as an actual processor. I mean, can it be fabricated? Yes. After it is fabricated, can it still run you know, the code as we see it in this class? The answer is yes, okay? But is it worth the money to fabricate it in any way? The answer is no. So the only purpose of this processor is to illustrate you know, what happens inside an actual real processor, okay? And that's something that you need to know because you know, there is a upper division version of this class at a four-year university. So having this kind of knowledge going into a four-year university to continue as a junior is going to be very helpful. Okay? That is the whole purpose of the toy processor here. Now, just because it's a toy processor doesn't mean that it cannot get things done. It really can actually get things done. It can, it, you can actually implement the uh, algorithm to solve the Tower of Hanoi using this toy processor. Now, that is not a... It's a very simple algorithm in a certain sense, but it's also not so simple in some other senses. So we'll get to that algorithm. Um, as we progress in the semester. All right, so it is very busy, okay? So the first question is, how do we analyze this processor, okay? So one thing we can do is to start with what it can do. So I'm switching back to the uh, browser here. Uh, in today's lab, there is a uh, there are a few links, okay? One link is going to this particular spreadsheet here. This is really just a spreadsheet to show you information, okay? There's no calculation, there's nothing automated in this spreadsheet here. So for those people who would prefer to download this, 
print it out, okay, or store it as an Excel spreadsheet on your local hard drive, feel free to do so, okay? This one is strictly just informational. So what we have here is a description of the instructions that are implemented in TTP. Um, column B is what we call the mnemonics. In other words, these names, okay, like halt, no op, um, this is a com copy register, and so on. So those are called mnemonics. It makes it a little bit easier to remember what each op code is doing. Column A is a list of op codes. Now, this part relates directly back to the von Neumann architecture. In other words, when we store instructions inside the memory of a computer, because von Neumann came up with that brilliant idea, the instructions are not stored in a way that you know how to interpret. They're all stored in zeros and ones. And the processor inherently knows how to interpret those, those instructions. So I'll give you an example here. And we'll go ahead and even you know, try that out today. I'm going to start with this one here. Okay, so we'll start with row 24. This is an instruction to perform a bitwise knot on a particular register. So the binary code of the instruction is 1011, and then there's XX. Okay, I'll explain that in just a little bit. 00. zero. That is the bit pattern that the processor is expecting if you want the processor to perform a bitwise knot on one of the four registers. Now, I'll also explain which four registers we are talking about because the processor has a lot of registers. But the bottom line is the bit pattern of 1011 something something and a 00 is what we want to store in RAM in order to tell the processor that we want to perform a bitwise knot on one of the four registers. Do we have any questions about that? So it's a very general, a high level connection with the concept of the von Neumann architecture. We are storing instructions in RAM. What kind of instructions are we storing? They are going to look like column A in terms of the bit pattern. Do we have any questions about that high level description and the high level connection from what we have been talking about to this particular spreadsheet here? No questions? Okay, all right. So if there are no questions, then I'll further explain what XX is representing. So if you go all the way to the top of the spreadsheet, it specifies, you know, XX specifies one of the four registers. If XX is 00, zero we are specifying register A. If XX is 01, we specify register B, and so on. So those two bits allow us to specify one of the four software accessible registers, registers A, B, C, or D. All right? So the next question is, Okay, if I were you, I would have the next question, which is, where are those four registers? You know, in, in terms of the processor, where do they reside? So I will keep my highlight on this row here, and I'll switch back to Logisim. So the four registers are actually inside the, uh, inside the register bank. This is what I call a register bank, because inside there are four registers that are software or program accessible. All of the other registers, you cannot designate or use them explicitly. They are useful in the processor, but you do not have direct access to the other to all of the other registers. But the four registers, A, B, C, and D, are software accessible, which means when you write your code, okay, you can specify, oh, I want to do this operation getting information from these registers and storing the result into that register. Your program, your instruction can specify that. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what I mean by software accessible register? Okay, all right. So these four registers, they're also general purpose registers. In other words, what I can do with register A 
I can do it with register B as well. I can also do it with register C as well as register D. There are no special opcode that require the use of a particular register that cannot work with other registers. So these are all what we call general purpose registers. All right, so now that we know where the registers are, now that we also know the format of the one byte or the eight bit to specify bit wise not, we're gonna make it work. We will program this into the processor and actually watch the whole thing happen. All right, so are we ready for this? All right, cool, all right. So some there are certain things you might need to write down or jot down along the way. You know, there are certain terms that I will be introducing. So you probably want to be ready to take notes, okay? All right, so the first thing is, I cannot just say any one of the four registers. The actual opcode needs to designate a particular register. So I'll let the class decide out of the four registers, A, B, C, or D, which one do we want to work with today? Okay, so we'll work with register C. Okay, so I make a note in a notepad. Give me a second here to start up mouse pad. All right. So I'm just using this you know, notepad thing here to remember what we have talked about. So I'm going to say we want to perform not C. Now, exactly what does that do? Okay, so in other words, you can see that there are four columns describing each opcode. Column A is seen from the perspective of the processor itself. It is a binary. It's all specified in zeros and ones. Only the processor can remember that very natively because we don't remember you know, zeros and ones you know, that well. Column B is what we call the mnemonics. It is a very abbreviated version of English, okay, or English words, to describe the operation. Some of these are pretty easy to understand, like not X, okay? Some of these are a little bit more cryptic. Like CMPXY is compare X to Y, okay? And then we have CPR up there a little bit, uh, it's not in view right now, but CPR stands for copy register. Okay, so those are called mnemonics. They tend to be very short because the you know, programmers do not like to type a lot of stuff. And mnemonic as a concept came along when programming was still done on punch cards. So if each character requires then a row on the punch card and you have to select the right character to punch out, Additional characters like JUMP, the extra U, is going to take extra time. And that's why, you know, mnemonics tend to be extremely abbreviated. Uh, some of these are really super abbreviated, like ST stands for store, S-T-O-R-E, okay? LD stands for load, LD, which is up here. And then some of the other ones are a little bit more obvious, like... Uh, and or, those are more obvious, or increment, decrement, those are also more obvious. So that's what column B is, is for mnemonics. So that you don't have to remember, oh, if I want to negate the content of a particular register, I have to remember the bit pattern of 1011, whatever the register is, and then 00, zero so that you don't have to remember that. Are we still doing okay so far? You know, Understanding why there's column A, which is what the processor understands, and why there's column B, which is what makes it a little bit easier for you guys to specify the instructions. Okay, all right, so moving on to column C. Column C, I would say, is probably one of the most important columns because it is called a register transfer language method to describe what is going on inside the processor. So the term is called RTL, or Register Transfer Language. Register Transfer Language. It is a particular way to describe what is going on inside the processor. 
So for the instructions that we are talking about on row 24, it, sim it is simply known as x equals puny x, which is actually a real C++ operator that you may not have been introduced to. It is a compound assignment operator where the bitwise knot of x is stored back into x itself. Actually, I'm, a, I'm not 100% sure that this is, uh, oh, I take it back, it is not a compound uh, assignment operator, it's just a, it's just a regular op uh, assignment operator here. The right hand side has a 2dx, which means we are taking the bitwise knot of x, otherwise known as, we have encountered bitwise knot before in this class, in the context of signed number representation. Do you guys remember that? So what is the other name of bitwise knot? Okay, we have two's complement, and then we have, and then we have one's complement. Very good. I was expecting people to say three's complement, three's company. You guys are way too young to know what is three's company, but Yes, one's complement, okay? One's complement is the same thing as he might not over here. Column D is really just an English description of column C for the most part. So uh, that's what column C is for. Uh, column D is just an English description. It's typically not as precise nor as concise as column C. I personally prefer to use column C to understand what the instruction does. Um, but, you know, that's up to you. All right, so what we want to do, yep. What is a PC mean? PC is the program counter. Very good question. The program counter is a very important register in the processor. It is not directly software accessible, even though it is crucial to the execution of instructions. So that's a very good question. We will actually get to see the program counter in action in just a little bit. Okay, very good. All right, so what I want to do now is to say what we want is register C to get the bitwise knot of itself. Okay, this is what we want to accomplish. But in order to accomplish this, we have to look up the instructions and say, how do we get this done? There are two ways to you know, understand how to get this done. The first one is you specify the binary code yourself, okay? It is a very tedious way to do this, but we can do it. So we can look up the binary code for bitwise knot to be 1011XX00. So now we say, okay, it's 1011, and then we have XX00. But that XX is already resolved because we know which register we want to use. We want to use register C, so the XX is going to be one zero. Is that okay? Does everybody understand how I find out which two bits, okay, to replace XX with? It's just based on which register am I using with you know, this particular opcode here. So one zero one 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 zero 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 is the opcode of bitwise knot of C and store that bitwise knot back into C itself. Is that okay? So you can you can write the entire program like this. Okay, you figure out what you want to do, and then you figure out the bit pattern by yourself, and then you write the entire program like this. It is extremely tedious to do it that way. And most people do not like to do it that way. So what else do can we do? Well, the other thing we can do is to utilize an assembler. So when we use an assembler, we use the mnemonic. When we use the mnemonic, we don't specify not one zero. Instead, we use the symbolic name of the register, which is really just register C in this case. Okay. So that really helps, okay, because with the assembler, let me go pull up the, the assembler first, okay.
by the time you get to the lab, you would also know where to find the assembler. So don't worry about, you know, you have no idea where to get everything yet. Okay, so it is already sitting in the share folder inside the processor subfolder. And the assembler is in the form of a Google Sheet. Like so. It has its own description and also the page log. So you can ignore the read me tab if you don't want to spend any time to read all that stuff. Because for the most part, it's really just a log of what features did I add, what bug did I fix, and so on. And you can jump straight to the source code here. So this is what you usually would type in in column A. I would not you know, edit the program inside a spreadsheet because it's just not what it's designed for. What you can do is to go to a you know any type of text editor, Notepad works fine. Okay, so you go to Notepad, and then you just say, oh, this is what I want to specify. Because not is the mnemonic, and then C specifies which register I want to work with. So now I have a really short program. Every program should also start with a halt instruction, because otherwise the processor really doesn't know when to stop executing from the memory locations. So even though we can see that, oh, the only instruction in, in the entire program is not C, the memory space of the processor is filled with bytes, okay? And the, pro the, the processor doesn't know when to stop executing the program. It'll just keep going and going. It will, it will interpret memory locations as if they are actual opcode, even when they were not actual opcode, okay? So that's why it's always helpful to put a halt instruction here at the end of the program. So what you do is you go to column A, you take out the entire column A, okay? So you just select the entire column A, you'll delete, and then you copy, select, uh, control A, select all, control C, copy, and then control V, to paste into column A, and that's how you put a program into the assembly. All right, so what is the advantage of using the assembler? So that you don't have to remember the binary bit pattern of every single instruction. The assembler will do it automatically for you. So if you go to, there are various tabs in the assembler. Some of these are super useful, some of these are somewhat useful. So I try to arrange you know, to make the most useful ones you know, at the left-hand side of the tabs, and the less useful ones are further to the right-hand side. So the first thing you might want to do is to go to the Assemble tab. So the Assemble tab, is it looks like this. Column A is resembling exactly what uh, instruction you have typed. The comments are going to be cleaned out, so you cannot see the comments anymore. Column W is the address. So this is at address zero, zero. We are going to have a byte B8 over here. Can someone tell me what is the binary bit pattern of B8? B8 is in hexadecimal. So how do we translate B8 back into um, a binary bit pattern? It's a table lookup thing, right? Okay, so what is B in base 2? It's 1, 0, 1, 1, okay? And what is 8? It's a 4 bit bit pattern. 1, zero, yeah, go ahead. 1, 0, 0, 0, that is correct. So if you think about B8 as 1011, 1000, didn't we see that bit pattern earlier somewhere? Yes or no? Okay. So let me show you where we saw that. This is where we saw that earlier. I hand assembled the instruction, came to the same bit pattern here. This is at location one. It has a byte of zero, 01 as well. That specifies the halt instruction. So this is a very short program, um, but the assembler tells you know, it's a tool that you can use so that you know for more complex programs, you don't have to hand assemble 
the, the opcode. We can rely on the assembler to convert from the mnemonic specification into the binary opcode. Saves you a lot of time. Are we still doing okay so far? Understanding you know, the tool itself. So the tool is really a translation tool. It's, it's kind of like a compiler, except it's not called a compiler. This is called an assembler. It is doing the translation from mnemonic, like Nazi and also Halt, and it translates those into the binary bit pattern, like 1011, 1000 for the Nazi, and then for uh, the Halt instruction, it translates to 0000001. So that's the job of the assembler. All right, so now that we have the assembler, assembled the program. What do we do next? There's a file, there's a tab here called the RAM file. So you click on that one. Okay. It has some really kind of awkward looking content, especially on the first line. The first row should say D2.0 wrong. If it doesn't say that, that means there's some kind of error in your program. You should fix it first. So the way we work with this particular tab is we go to file and then we click on download, and I typically use CSV. If you want to use TSV, that works too, but I personally just pick CSV, and then it will give you an option to save the file. There we go. All right, so I'm just going to save this as uh, not dot not not dot CSV, and it's going to be saved to my temp folder. Press the enter key, now it is saved. What do we do next? Well, next we switch to the processor, which is running in Logisim right here. And we have to go back to the main part and go all the way to the RAM component, which is right here. Right click here, click on load image. And then we go back to the folder where it is stored, which is in the temp folder this time. It is called not.csv in this case. So I can use a full path specification so that I don't need to rely on the, uh, the navigation tool inside Java to go back to the folder. So it's a really kind of neat, quick, quick and easy way to do it. You can do it in Windows too. You just have to know how to specify your full path in Windows. So you can also see now the RAM is loaded with those two bytes, right? I could have just typed it in, okay? I could have just typed in E801 when I used the poking tool on the RAM component itself. For smaller programs, it is okay to hand assemble and also to program the RAM content by yourself. It's perfectly okay. But for longer programs, it is much easier to use the assembler. One more thing about the assembler, because I know some people including some of my colleagues, do not like you know, Google Doc or Google Sheets in this case. So they want to download this as an Excel file. It is not going to work. The assembler will only work as a Google Sheets document, downloading it you know, into your, onto your own computer and try to open it inside Microsoft Office will not work. I'll be clear on that one. Because every semester, somebody tries to do that and will tell me that it's not working. Well, it's, it's definitely not going to work because, you know, it contains code that will only run as a part of Google Sheets, not as Excel. All right. So now here comes the exciting part. It's running this program here. Okay. So everything is now ready to run. The question is, uh, so where do we start? Okay, in other words, um, where do we start analyzing this program when there are so many things going on all at the same time? I'll give you this idea, okay? If you're starting to, if you're trying to understand how the program works, the starting place is always the microcode pointer. Okay, the microcode pointer is a register and you can tell you know, that it is a 12-bit register, unlike the other ones. 
all of those, all of the other registers except for the flags register or AJ registers, this is the only register that will update on the falling edge. All of the other registers will update on the rising edge. This is the only one that updates on the falling edge. It's called a microcode pointer. So the U is really an approximation of the mu, the Greek symbol mu symbol, which is micro. So this is what we call a microcode pointer. Okay, so let's take a look at what it does. Okay, so I'm explaining the processor as we go. You can see the output of this register, which is the Q output. Let me go back to the poking tool here. You can see how the output of the microcode pointers goes straight into the A port of RAM, of ROM, sorry, if I take it back. This is the A port of ROM. So that means whatever the microcode pointer is, is specifying a location in this particular ROM component. Is that okay? Yes, hopefully, okay, all right. <clears throat> and then when I click on this ROM component, we'll get to see the attributes associated with this ROM component. It has a very odd configuration. The address bit width is 12, which means it has 4,096 locations. It has a data bit width of 46. It's not eight, it's not 16, it's not 32. It's a very kind of unusual number of 26. So every location in the ROM is going to specify 26 binary digits, zeros and ones, okay? And it is always enabled because when you look at the select port here, it is connected to a constant of one, which means you know, there's nothing else that it needs in order to be selected because it's always selected. It's always going to be active. Are we doing okay so far with this part of the analysis? You start with the microcode pointer. You look at where it points to in the ROM. And then we look at the ROM, the, the location here. So at location 000, it has a content in, of, in hexadecimal 1080007. That's in hexadecimal. So that means in phase two, we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. It's a really long bit pattern. Where does the bit pattern go? It goes to the D port. The D port goes straight into a splitter right here. The splitter you know, goes into another splitter, like this one here. So the bottom line, you don't have to really track down everything. But the bottom line is the ROM output, okay, which is here. The ROM output eventually breaks down to all of these tunnels over here. Now, there are a lot of tunnels here. And you know, the first time you look at this, it's like, that's crazy. How do I track all of these things, right? So what might help you is to draw a map, okay? So ev after every single class, you draw a map, and then you just identify the ones that we have talked about in the, today's lecture. So that way you get more familiarized with which tunnel goes where and what is the purpose of that thing. Great, so what are we gonna do now? Well, now we try to understand what the processor is trying to do. What, act what components are active? and what we are doing with those components. Are we still doing okay so far with the analysis of figuring out what the processor is going to do? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so we scroll up and then we try to find out what is active. So remember, there are only a few things that can be quote unquote active. Those would be RAM and the registers. Okay, you always follow the RAM, the registers, and to a certain extent, the ALU. So don't focus on the multiplexers. Don't focus on the demultiplexers. They are only there to help us route the signal around, okay? But they are not very useful components by themselves. We focus on the registers.
So what we want to do is to figure out what registers are being activated now. In other words, it's being updated. So we can see that the program counter is one of the most important registers. It is not being updated. Okay, how do I know that the program counter is not being updated? In order for a register to be to be updated, there are two conditions that need to be met. What are those two conditions? Did you study? <laughs> yes. Exactly. Very good. Okay. So the register needs to be enabled first, which means the EN has to be a one, and then we have to see a rising edge. Well, we don't see the EN being a one because it is a dark green, which means it is a zero. Okay. So maybe it's not going to be uh, being, it's not updated. This is the instruction register. Ah, okay. I can see something is happening here because the EN of the instruction register is a bright green which means it is a one. So it has met one of the two conditions to get updated. It is enabled. All it is missing right now is the rising edge. Does that make sense? Okay, so mentally, I'm going to say, okay, that's one of the things. Now, the next thing we want to do is to look, is to think in terms of dependency. Okay, so this is the part where I'm going to say, um, Without me prompting, okay, the next question in your head should be asking, okay, so we know the instruction register is going to be updated. You should be asking a question automatically. The question is, how is it up being updated? Okay? So this is something that um, I think, you know, when you are listening to the lecture, listening to me explaining all of this stuff here, the very moment that we know that the instruction register is about to be updated, it should automatically prompt you to ask the question of how is it going to be updated? Who is providing the content to update the instruction register? Is that okay? Now obviously that part has nothing to do with assembly language programming, but it has everything to do with how to take a class, especially a college level class, and also how to read technical you know, uh, manual and also the technical you know, document, is to automatically prompt those questions in your head as soon as you see that, oh, this, is, this thing is updated. How is it going to be updated? Who's providing the content to update this thing here? So that is when you have to do some actual you know, groundwork or footwork by following the D line, okay, to figure out where does it go, okay? Who is providing the content to update the instruction register? So using LogiSim is very helpful because when, if you're log using LogiSim and you use the poking tool and you're poking on a specific wire, it will light up the entire node. Does everybody understand what a wire is and what a node is, okay? So that makes it easier to track down where it's going. Now, whatever is specified in the content cannot be an input. This is an input. This is a multiple. This is one input one of a multiplexer. It cannot specify content, so we can rule out that this is the component. This is the same situation. It's the input of a multiplexer. So we are just you know, following this quick line here. This is a demultiplexer. This is one of the outputs of a demultiplexer. But we can rule this one out too because this particular demultiplexer has an enable, but the enable is a dark green, which means the demultiplexer is not enabled. So it cannot be driving one of its outputs. Okay? So, so far I'm ruling out things, right? And then we track down to the right hand side, okay? And then eventually, this is an output pin which does not drive anything. It's only here to reflect something, but it doesn't drive anything. So eventually, we got to RAM here. Can someone tell me whether RAM is being used at this point? How can we tell? RAM is being used because... The bright green going into which port? There's one specific port 
that determines whether the component is being used or not. So select, okay, S-E-L, very good. So the select here has a bright green, which means the RAM component is being utilized, okay? So when the RAM component is being utilized, there are two questions that you should be asking you know, right away. The two questions is, one, what location is being utilized? Two, am I reading from that location or am I writing or updating that location? Those are the two automatic question, questions you, that you should ask. As soon as you see the RAM component is being utilized, you should be asking those two questions automatically. Is that okay? Because that's the whole purpose of RAM, okay? You know, it is a memory device. It stores a whole bunch of, uh, it has a whole bunch of locations. You can read from those locations. You can also overwrite those locations. So if RAM is being used, then the automatic question is to ask, who is specifying which location is being accessed? And two, are we reading from that location or are we writing to that location? So we'll answer the second question first because it's the easier one to answer. Are we reading from RAM or are we writing to RAM? Just from visually, visually looking at the RAM component and the ports, can you tell, are we reading or are we writing? We are reading, very good. Okay, so we are reading because the LD port has a one. The LD port having a one means that we are reading from the memory, from, from the RAM device. Okay, so now we have one additional question. Okay, so we have a total of two questions that we have not answered yet. The first one is, which location? Who is specifying the location to read from in RAM? And two, where is the content going to? We know where the content is going to already. It's going to the instruction register because that's how we track all the way to the D port is the D port connects to the D port. The D port of RAM connects to the D port of the instruction register. The instruction register is enabled at this point. So we know that the output of whatever location is being addressed is going to update the instruction register. So that answers one part of the mystery. But the second part of the mystery is I can see that we are addressing location zero, zero, but who is doing that, right? So that's the next question. So studying the T studying text toy processor at this point becomes a series of questions that you should ask as we go through the operations of the processor. That is how I expect people to study, quote unquote study, at this point of time, is to prompt yourself all of these questions, and then answer those questions by going through the processor, tracking down the connections, understanding the components, and so on. So let me try to answer that question now. We know the A port is used to specify what location we want to access. So the A port goes to a lot of places. So let's scroll back a little bit here. And by the way, this bar can be moved. So if I don't need as much space over here, I can kind of bring that a little. And we can see that it goes into the output of a multiplexer. So now we see that the output of this multiplexer is going to the A port of RAM. What should I do next? What is the next thing that I should do? Exactly, figure out which input of the multiplexer connects to the output. Now, how do I figure that out? Right, this multiplexer is as simple as it gets. It has two inputs, one output, and a select. So from just from visually looking at the select input, can you tell which input is being connected to the output right now with the multiplexer that is in question? What is bright green again? One. 
What is the purpose of the select port? To, to specify which input connects to the output, right? So what would be your conclusion? The bottom one, input one. Okay, very good. So now we know we should track the bottom one, which is this one here. And it goes all the way to the output of the program counter. Okay, so now we have completed the analysis of what we call the fetch cycle of executing an instruction. This is called the fetch cycle of executing an instruction. And I'm going to put it into my mouse pad here, which means it is of a certain significance to me. And it should probably be of a certain significance to you as well, which means I'm hinting that you might want to write it down in your notes as well. So when you execute an instruction, the first step or step zero is what we call a fetch cycle. The fetch cycle, if you want to use RTL to describe it, it is the instruction register is getting whatever the program counter is pointing to. That is called the fetch cycle of executing an instruction. Is that okay so far? Okay. <clears throat> I have to look at the time because, you know, I, this, this particular lecture is going to be intense, you know, quite intense. I have to make sure the recording is still going. All right, so now that we have fetched the opcode that we are about to execute into the instruction register, what are we going to do next? Okay, well, we'll try to find out. Okay, so the first thing is we are still at a zero of the clock right now because you can see how the clock is a dark green. So when we do a single edge, which means we can, there are two ways to give it a single edge. We can go to simulate and go to tick once, or you can use control T, which is the shortcut key to do exactly the same thing. So I'm going to type control T on the keyboard, which will turn the clock from dark green to light green, which means it's going to have, it's going to be a zero to one transition, a rising edge. So here we go, control T. And you can see how the instruction register is now updated to a B8, which is not surprising because you know that's exactly how we expected the processor to do, is to read from location 00, which is pointed to by the program counter, grab the content, which is B8, at that location and put it into store in the instruction register. Okay, so everything is happening as expected. Nothing, no, none of the other things will update on the falling edge, so I don't have to worry about the rest of the processor. The only thing that updates on the falling edge is the microcode pointer itself, which is this guy here. And we are about to have a falling edge. Because clock is high at this point, the next transition is going to go low, so we have a falling edge. So the question is, how do you think the microcode pointer is going to update itself? First of all, is it going to update itself? Well, the enable is a, is a bright green. It's connected to a constant of one. So that means, yes, it is going to up, it's going to update. So if it is going to update, the automatic question that you need to ask is how is it going to get updated? And the way you figure out how it's going to be updated is to track down the D port, like this one. It goes straight, it is coming straight out of a multiplexer. And what do you do? You analyze how the multiplexer is configured so that you can know which input of the multiplexer to track down. So from just from visually looking at the multiplexer, the select bit is a one, which means you need to track down input one of the multiplexer. That is coming out of an adder this is just a regular adder. What is it adding? Well, it's adding whatever the microcode pointer has and a one. So it's, it, really, it really is just adding one to the microcode pointer. So when you click on the wire, you can also tell that you know, the output of the adder is just one. 
because the micro pointer itself is a zero, the adder is adding one to the micro pointer's own value, it becomes one. Zero plus one is one. Okay, not really surprising. So on the on the falling edge, what should we expect to see in terms of the micro pointer? Because we know nothing else is going to update. The micro pointer is the only thing that is sensitive to the falling edge. So what should we, what are we expecting to see again? One zero zero one in the micro pointer. It auto increases. Okay, there we go. Control T, and voila. Super exciting, right? The micro pointer is now at zero zero one, and the next location of ROM is being addressed. Whew. Okay. So now we are about to have a rising edge again. So what do we do when we are about to have a rising edge? We analyze the rest of the processor to figure out who is going to update. Then we ask the questions of how is it going to be updated. Okay, so we'll do the analysis. So we go straight back to the instruction register first because that was updated last time. You can you can see that no, it's not enabled. Okay, fine. We'll track some track down the other registers. Is the program counter? Aha. The program counter has its enabled port being a one. So we know the program counter is about to be updated. Is that okay? Then what do we ask? We know the program counter is about to be updated. What is the follow-up question? How is it updated? Okay, who is providing the value to update the program counter. And how do we figure that out? We track down the D port of the register because D, the D port of a register is the input to the register. It's coming from a multiplexer. The multiplexer has a select bit of a zero. We track down input zero in this case. It has a very similar circuit compared to the one that we analyzed earlier. It's coming out of an adder. The adder is adding the current content of the program counter, which is zero, a carry of one, okay? So we are basically just adding one to the program counter, and that's why the output is a one. So that means the program counter itself is about to auto increase. Is that okay? The reason why we want to auto increment the program counter is we don't need to point to location zero, zero anymore. We have already done whatever we needed to do with location zero, zero. We have fetched the opcode from location zero, zero already. So we should prepare for the next fetch cycle by auto incrementing the program counter. Okay? <clears throat> so this particular operation really has no name. So we're just going to go ahead here and say the program counter is auto-incrementing itself. But nonetheless, this is, it, it, has, its no, it has no name by itself. You can also kind of, <clears throat> if you so prefer, you can also kind of do the, you can associate it with the first part here, which is auto-incrementing the program counter. It's a post-increment. You can kind of put it, into the fetch cycle itself, if that is how you want to document it, that's fine. Okay, that's one way to document it. All right, so we switch back to the processor here. We are going to execute, you know, the next clock. Yep. Um. The ROM at the, the, the micro pool pointer pointing to the ROM, the ROM location you know, splits up to all the zeros and ones, and those zeros and ones dictate you know, what component is active, which component is not active, and how they should be connected. That's how we can figure out that the fetch cycle is connecting the D port of RAM all the way to the D port of the instruction register. It turns on the RAM component by turning on the select line of the 
the select port of RAM. It also connects you know, through the multiplexer so that the output of the program counter connects to the A port of RAM. Those are all determined by the content of the ROM location. They are not the same. The yeah. right local pointer dictates the location of the ROM. No, I mean like the program counter is about to increment to one only because of the ROM content at location 001 in ROM is directing the rest of the circuit to auto increment the program counter. So they're, they're not always um, like auto increment. They are always going to do the same thing because location 001 in ROM is always following location 000 in ROM. And then location 001 in ROM is always telling the content, the program counter to auto increment. So the order of the analysis is you always start with the ROM mm -hmm. because the content in the ROM dictates what the rest of the processor is going to do and how it's going to be done. All right, so we are about to do another control T right here, and you can see, very exciting, you know, the program counter is now incremented to one. The next falling edge is gonna update the microcode pointer, right? So now we have to update how the microcode pointer is going to be updated. Same kind of analysis, but different conclusions. So we look at the input to the microcode pointers, it's coming out of the multiplexer, but this time the select is a zero, which means we have to follow input zero here. Now that one is a little bit more complex because input zero to the multiplexer is connected to a splitter. Let me magnify first, okay, so they can see better how the splitter is configured. So right here, there we go. So we can see how the splitter is configured so that bit zero to bit three is coming out of a constant of zero. Are we, are we okay with that first, okay? So that means bit zero, bit one, bit two, and bit three, they're guaranteed to be zero on this wire. They go like, okay, so where's the rest then? Bit four to bit 11, is coming from the tunnel that we call instruction. Is that okay? So where is the tunnel instruction? Where is it coming out of? It's coming out of the instruction register itself. So let me ask you this question. So when we, when we update the microcode pointer this time, what do you think is going to be the content of the microcode pointer itself? This is a very important step in the execution cycle of the, the, the execution of an instruction. It's called a default cycle. But I want to ask, I, I want you guys to tell me the answer. On the falling edge, which is about to happen, what is going to be the value of the microcode pointer? Knowing that the instruction register is E8 at this point. Not okay. You, you. It's good that you know there's an extra zero somewhere. The question is, where is that extra zero? Huh? B eight zero. Very good. Okay. So B eight zero is the correct answer. B eight zero is what we expect in the microcode pointer, because bit zero to seven, the entire instruction register is becoming bit four to bit 11. So everything is shifted to the left-hand side by four bits, basically. Are we understanding that concept, okay? Now to understand that concept, there are other ways to do it too. 
using the poking tool, you can see that this wire is just B8. 1011 one is the B, 1000 zero, 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 zero is the 8. Using the poking tool, we can see this is just four, you know, four zeros, okay? It's constant. So, <clears throat> so when we click on this one here, we can see how the two components are combined using our quote unquote splitter here. The most significant 8 bits is really just whatever the instruction register has. The least significant four bits is coming from the constant of zero. So all we have done is to shift the content of the instruction register to the left-hand side by four bits. That's all we have done. Are we good so far? And that is going into the multiplexer. The multiplexer has a select of zero. So input zero becomes the output of the multiplexer. And because we are at a falling edge, the micro pointer will now update itself to B80. All right? So for this, this particular phase has a name that is important. So this is called the decode phase. So this is called decode cycle. And decode basically means the micro code pointer gets whatever the instruction register has left shifted by four bits. And for those of you who do not really like the use of the left shift operator because you have never seen it before, that's okay because it really is the same thing as multiplication by 16. You can use one way or the other, doesn't matter, they, they boil down to the same thing. <clears throat> All right, and this is commands, so I'm just going to use slash slash here. Okay, so getting back to the processor, I do a control T, voila! Oh. The micro cool pointer is now pointing to B80. Now remember, B80 has nothing to do with where the opcode is in RAM. It has to do with it has to do with the opcode itself. The opcode that we are trying to execute is B8 itself. B80 in ROM contains the bit pattern to do exactly just that. So this gibberish here is basically instructing the rest of the processor to make the connections so that register C goes out of the register bank, go into the ALU, go to the NOT gate. The output of the NOT gate is going all the way back to the input of the, in, of the register bank and update register C when the, you know, on, the, on the rising edge of the clock. So that's what it's supposed to do. We have to make sure that that actually is gonna happen, okay? So the next phase here, is going back to the top of the processor and do the analysis. Now, since I already have a pretty good idea of what it's supposed to do, let's just double check, right? Okay, so we can see that RIEN is a one, which means this multiplexer is enabled. RIMUX is a one, which means we're using input one to serve as the, to connect to the output, which is gonna go into here. This wire, is connected to the output of the ALU. And then when we look into the ALU, we can spec we can see the ALU itself is enabled. ALU enable is, en is enabled. It's a one. We can also see which operation we are selecting. Uh, OPSEL or operation select is a zero one one. So it goes into this D multiplexer here. Zero one one is a it's a three, which means we're looking at a fourth output. This is input zero, input one, input two, this is input three. There's no output from this the multiplexer, but there's one from the other one. So once again, we have output zero, output one, output two, this is output three. Output three is going to, guess what? A NOT gate. Okay? So 
the input here is going through the demultiplexer, going into the, the input of the NOT gate. The output of the NOT gate is going into the input of a multiplexer. And this multiplexer has the same select, which is selecting three, so that the output of the NOT gate becomes the output of the multiplexer, which then becomes the output of the ALU itself. So the ALU is performing the NOT operation. But the question is, are we really sure that we are routing register C to in one of the register bank, I mean to the ALU? So to understand that, we have to look at this demultiplexer first. So this demultiplexer is enabled. When we look at, when we look at the select of this demultiplexer, it specifies a zero one which means, okay, everything seems to be good because output one of the demultiplexer does go to in one of the ALU and the input is connected to uh, output one at this point. So now we have to look at output zero of the register bank and see whether that in return connects to the output of register C. Right click, view register bank. We track down register output zero it is coming out of a multiplexer that has four inputs to select from. Out of the four inputs to select from, we can see that the select is one zero, which is a two. This is input zero, input one, this is input two. We track down input two, and it is coming out of register C. Okay, so we, what we have verified up to this point is we are indeed using register C to connect it to the ALU to perform the device not operation. <clears throat> the question is, are we going to update register C itself with the negation of itself? That's the next question. So to answer that question, we have to look at register C. It is currently selected because you can see how the enable of register C is a light green. It is selected, which means register C is indeed going to be updated on the rising edge. But just because it is going to update on the rising edge doesn't mean it's getting the right value to update. So we have to make sure that it is routed correctly to the output of the ALU. So now we have to look at the routing of the input, if there's any. So we have to look at the input of the register. And we can see that this is a multi-drop connection. Register input of the register bank just blindly connect to all the E ports of the registers. This is why the enable pin is useful. It's because we can do something like this. We can have one single wire or one single node that connects to all the E port of a bunch of registers. But by controlling which register has E and B a one, we can now say, oh, only you are going to update based on the new input, okay? So that's why you'll be EN or the uh, EN is called the uh, enable. That's why the enable of a register is useful because we can select which register actually gets updated. So using the decoder, which has a select of one zero, we have now designated register C to be updated. So the question is, am I indeed routing the output of the ALU back to the register input of the register bank? The answer is, that's pretty obvious because that's how we made that connection. We analyzed this part already earlier. So that's how we know that on the rising edge, register C is going to update to the bitwise not of itself. So what do you think is going to be the bitwise not of register C itself? It's also mirrored here as an output pin. It is currently all zeros. So after the rising edge, what do you expect to see? All ones, okay? So control C, control T, sorry, control T, and it gets updated. So what I have done so far, you know, in the past, I don't know, maybe 45, 40 minutes or so, is really to go down the execution of one single instruction. This is, by the way, the execution of the actual instruction. I have done, what I have done so far is to go through the analysis 
of how to track down the execution of instructions. Now, is it tedious? Yes. Okay, I cannot say that this is not tedious. It is tedious. Is it impossible to do? No. If it was impossible to do, I would not have been teaching this class. Okay. Will it require effort on your part? Okay, to really do go through the whole exercise in order to track down, you know, okay, this goes here, this is updated because of that, and so on and so forth. Yes, in fact, quite a bit. Okay. So your lab today has a certain component of not doing this crazy stuff, okay, you know, because you know there's not enough time in the lab session to do all of this stuff here. So what you need to do is to take the lab itself, okay, after you turn it in, and use this technique to track down the execution of the one of the instructions that's mentioned in the lab itself. Okay? If you don't go through this process yourself, you won't be understanding the processor well enough to do well in the second exam. So this is how we study at this point of this class. It's not to read, it's not to memorize, it is to go through the whole process step by step, okay, to understand how the components in the processor interact with each other the first time you do this, I guarantee you it's not going to be easy because there's a lot of stuff to track down. So I have some suggestions. <clears throat> you can go to File, you can go to Export Image, and then you can export the entire circuit as a TNG. I would recommend TNG because it's lossless. And then you can print it out. You print it out on a piece of paper, and then you take your, your highlighter, and then you color code the components that are actually cortical active. There are only a few components that are cortical active that can be enabled. The registers, RAM, those are the only components that can be cortical active. You can also include the uh, ALU if you want to. And then you print multiple sheets of that map. Okay? When you analyze, let's say, the subtract instruction, you go through this exercise, and you highlight the wires and stuff like that. You document the whole thing. And then when you track down another instruction, let's say LD or ST, you know, that's something that we're going to do next week. You do the same thing. After you have done this a few times, you would have memorized where the signals, where the tunnels are located, which one is doing what, you know, in what context, and so on and so forth. That is how we study at this point of this class. Without a full understanding of the instructions uh, and how they execute inside the processor, the rest of this semester is going to be difficult. I'm going to say it is going to be difficult without a thorough understanding of how instructions work inside the processor itself. Okay. Um, are there any questions? Because I've been talking basically nonstop since the beginning of this class. The fetch cycle starts with the rising. Yep. <laughs> Say again? The D code is on the falling edge, yes. The yep. Mm -hmm. Not oh not not only three, it's more than that. So this takes you know um, so it takes a rising edge. It takes a falling edge, and then a rising edge again to update the P, the program counter. This takes the falling edge, and then after this, we have execute. Okay, so execute cycle. So execute cycle cannot be really be described because it depends on where the micro core point is pointing to, right? So this is going to be done with usually usually just one single rising edge. And then when we get to the next falling edge, we reset the whole thing. So the next falling edge is going to uh, repeat, go, go back to the fetch cycle. So this falling edge here, it will go back to the fetch cycle. And I can show you that. Okay. So just to conclude this entire discussion, OK, 
Okay, so we have already executed the instruction because we can see how the register is one all ones at this point. So once again, you know, if you want to track down the execution of the instructions, you always start with the ROM component. So now the next thing is the falling edge. The falling edge is going to update the micro code pointer. So how are we updating the micro code pointer? Because the select is a one, that means we're auto incrementing the micro code pointer. But what you're going to see is not going to it's not going to make sense. So what I want to do is to right click on the ROM and then go to edit content. So one thing that I want to remind everybody not to do is to change the content of ROM. Okay, do not change the content of ROM because it is already pre-programmed to work correctly with all the opcode. If you change it, it's not going to work. So we want to go to location 680, which is a whole way down here. Six B, sorry, it's B80. All right, so B80, this is what we just executed earlier. The next location is two followed by all zero. So like, okay, what does that do? Okay, let's go back and figure out what it, what that is doing. And by the way, the, re the way you read the content of ROM is something that we talked about on Tuesday already. The left hand side, the things that are italic, that is telling you the address of the first byte of each row in hexadecimal. Okay? So the question now is what does two followed by what six zeros is what is that representing? So what we want to do is to look at the output here and then we ask what is what what does it mean when you have like just a two and then followed by all zeros in hexadecimal. Okay. So this is all zero, 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 zero. Remember six zeros in hexadecimal. This is a two, which means it is a one zero, which means the most significant bit of the D port is gonna be a one. So like, okay, where does that go? The most significant bit of the output of the ROM is bit 25. Bit 25 goes through a, what is, what gate, what kind of gate is this one again? You really should know by now. It's an OR gate, very good. So it's an OR gate, so that means one of the two inputs of the OR gate becomes a one, you know, when we move on to the next location in ROM. What do you think is gonna be the output of this ROM, this particular OR gate? It will become, okay, let me, let me explain what I was about to explain. The current location is one followed by something, but the next location is a two followed by all zeros. The two followed by a bunch of zeros means bit 25 is going to be a one. That one is going into OR gate, so what is going to be the output of the OR gate? A one. Where is that one going to? to this port of a register, what is the what is the purpose of that port of a register? Sorry? A clear. Very good. Okay? It is a clear. And what happens when a clear port of a register becomes a one? It resets the register back to all zeros. So that's what's going to happen. Okay? In other words, when I type control T, you are not going to see the micro code pointer to increment to B81. Technically, it did. It will for a very short amount of time. And then the register reset itself back to 0, 0, 0. So here it goes. So now we are ready to fetch the next instruction. So the whole thing starts again. We fetch, we decode, we execute, we go all the way back to fetch decode, execute, and so on. All right, so today's you know, lecture is really important because even though I only use today's lecture to illustrate a very simple instruction, which is you know, taking the bitwise knot of a register and then storing that back to the same register, the process, okay, the steps that I went through, the reasoning that I went through when I tried to analyze what the processor is about to do, of what it is going to do, how it's going to do it, all of that applies to 
the other instructions that you'll be using in this semester. So I expect you guys to be able to replicate this process and analyze the execution of the other opcode in the processor. All right, so with that all said and done, <clears throat> we're going to go back to the lab because you do have a lab today. The lab today, I'm not taking row, so forget about the row taking here. So the lab today is called Familiarizing with the TTP toolchain. It has instructions on its own, okay? So be very careful and patient as you go through the instructions. And you probably want to keep the instructions around a little bit because some of the instructions are not only for the lab, it is also conceptual, so they can be helpful down the line a little bit as well. The access code is just TTP in all uppercase. That is not really surprising. And then you have the end until the end of the lab time to finish this one. I think most of you should be able to finish it like well within a time. Okay, it's not a difficult lab, but the lab itself contains instructions that you might find useful later on. So you might want to take notes as you go through the lab as well. All right, so that's it for today's lecture. I am going to stop the recording and then upload it to YouTube.